from the University of California's California China Climate Institute. This is Climate Dialogues with Jerry Brown. In episode three, Dr. Veer Bedron Ramanathan, Professor of Climate, Atmospheric Science, and Physical Ocean at UC San Diego, and renowned climate scientist, speaks with Institute Chair Jerry Brown on the latest climate science and its policy implications. Dr. Ramanathan was the first to discover the harms chlorofluorocarbons were causing to the Earth's atmosphere, and over his career has advised leaders in academia, government, and even the Vatican on climate change. Listen to their conversation now. You don't really need an introduction, but uh, I will say that you are been working on climate a long time at the University of California at San Diego. I work with the Vatican, scientists all over the world. Uh, so uh, you know a lot about this and you've been at it a long time and have seen uh, the trajectory of how uh, climate change from being really obscure has come into the mainstream. But being a mainstream focus doesn't mean uh, we've got our act together. So let me ask you just at the outset uh, to look ahead a little bit, uh, what, what kind of planetary uh, heating, warming, are we gonna see in the next 10 to 15 years? The next 10 years, 10 to 15, uh, I'm glad you uh, started on that. It's probably the most critical period this planet has ever focused in terms of uh, uh, climate change we will pass the planetary heating or others call it global warming, we'll pass the threshold of about 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is close to uh, uh, three degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> to be precise, they were 2.7. So what's the big deal about that? The planet is already warmer by a degree Celsius as of 2015. When it crosses the threshold of one and a half degrees uh, Celsius, it will be the hottest ever the planet has experienced since the last 150,000 years ago. Uh, you know, the earth goes through glacial, interglacial period the 130,000 years ago was the hottest we have now, and that was just about a degree warmer. So the sea level was higher by about uh, 20 to 30 feet. So that's, uh, uh, when that happens, I, I'm 90% uh, certain no matter what you governor do and what other leaders uh, in the nation and the world do, we are gonna pass that threshold because that warming is already in the bank. And my prediction is that climate change will move into all of our living rooms, no matter where you live, just like COVID is. COVID has tied me into my, uh, living room for the last year, year and a half. And there'll be a huge hue and cry from the public to take action finally. And I'm hoping we don't wait for that. We start those actions now. <clears throat> uh, Ron, let me ask you, uh, uh, the fact that sea level was 20 or 30 feet higher uh, with a comparable, well, at 1.5 centigrade. How, how sure are you of that? And if we're already at that temperature where we had this much higher sea level, uh, and you said, I think if I understood you, it's baked in. So well, the, let's suppose we went to zero uh, tomorrow, then uh, how long would it take us for sea level to rise 20 or 30 feet? because I see uh, reports that say sea level will rise 
three feet, maybe a little more uh, by the end of this century, by, 22, by the year 2200. So can you put yeah. some dates around a 20 yeah. to 30 foot a sea level and relate it to a temperature we've already passed? Yeah. Now, of course, as you say that, we're going to be much worse because we're not at zero and we're not going to be at zero for a while. We'll, yeah. we'll get to that. But I'd, I'd like right. to know just what's baked in. So people yeah. who are going to be around in X number of years that, that you're going to tell us when the sea level rise gets to 20 or 30 feet. Because that's pretty catastrophic, I would think. Yeah. I think that the, if we just rely on the model predictions, we're already baked in about close to five to six feet of sea level rise by 2100. Three, three feet was the prediction about 10 years ago. All that science is getting revised. So we are thinking in terms of five to six feet by 2100. But to go to 20 to 30 feet, you, the warming has to last for centuries. So fortunately, we have time to stop that. But even five to six feet would be uh, catastrophic. But wait a minute, you have time to stop it, but if it's occurring in climate and you want to stop it, that would mean you would have to reverse the CO2 and suck it out of the atmosphere and reduce the temperature not just stabilize it. Exactly. Well, that sounds like a much bigger task than I've been hearing about. That's interesting. Uh, I think you're, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> That's why I like to call it <clears throat> bending the curve. <clears throat> right now, the warming is, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> right now, the warming is increasing at a steep pace. Okay, it's already a degree, it's going to go to degree one and a half degrees Celsius in 15 years. Another 25 years will go to two degrees. People are talking about stabilizing the warming at a degree and a half. Okay, even the best predictions is talking about keeping it at a degree and a half. That's not enough. If you keep it at a degree and a half for a couple of hundred years, then you're talking about tens to 30, 20, 30 feet. What I'm proposing is that first, over the next 20, 30 years, don't let that warming get any hotter than a degree and a half, okay? Try to stabilize it and then bring it down. That curve has to be going down to below one degree to avoid this kind of 20, 30 feet catastrophic loss. Was that, I, did, I, did I address your question yeah. there? Yeah. yeah, so we do have time. Uh, that's quite a lot of time. But um, so would you say in this 10, I've heard you say it'd be even closer than 10 years to get to 1.5. Mm -hmm. And on the path we are right now, unless China, the US and India and Brazil and other countries do better than they're now apparently doing, uh, we're going to blow by 1.5 degrees centigrade before 2030, at least as a possibility. It's not not a not a remote possibility, uh, but uh, in the ballpark. No, no. It uh, not necessarily going to I'll tell you what. I think the way to think about this is that think of uh, carbon dioxide. Let's take carbon dioxide. Think of it like a blanket and the blanket is warming us because it's trapping the heat, just like a blanket on a cold winter night or your body keeps your body warm. That blanket is already a trillion tons thick, okay? Every year, we are adding about 20 billion tons to that blanket. So it's one to one. The CO2 is a trillion tons of CO2. It's there over our head. That's enough. That we know within 5%. It's a very, uh, in the institution I come from, we make those pioneering measurements. So we know exactly how much CO2 is over your head. We have added. 
Okay. And we're adding 20 tons, 20 million tons a year. No, uh, we, are, we are emitting 40 billion tons from fossil fuels and land clearance. About half of it stays in the air. The other half is sucked back by the ocean and the land. So we are adding 20 billion tons. So, to, so that's tiny amount compared to the trillion tons. Okay, so no matter what you do over the next 10 years, you cannot stop that degree and a half warming. That's a bad side. The good side is you're not going to be adding too much to that. Okay. That CO2 accumulates is on the long term, its effects uh, become worse and worse and worse. Uh, are you saying that you, by the fact that they remain, what gets worse and worse? The, the, the total that is there now or the fact that more is added every day? Uh, both. This one trillion tons, which is there, the heat it has added, we have seen only two thirds of it because the, uh, the earth and the ocean takes time to heat up the inertia of the system, okay? So the existing blanket itself is gonna add that another half a degree warming. And then on top of that, every year, you're making the blanket thicker, thicker, and thicker. So uh, that's why, okay, so, and you think we, you've said before, we have another uh, trillion we can add? No. Before uh, we get to zero? Before we you, get to when you, neutrality? When you say zero, you mean zero emissions? Yes, zero emissions. Yeah. That time period has shrunk. Uh, I'll tell you, if you want to keep the warming limited to degree and a half, that's in Celsius, in Fahrenheit, it's close to three degrees Fahrenheit. If you want to keep the warming below that, you have to do three things. First, you have to bring the fossil fuel emissions to zero in 20 years. The planet has to become fossil free. And then you have to cut down the emissions of these super pollutants. Uh, we have not talked about that yet. There are four pollutants of methane coming from natural gas and cattle, uh, ozone and refrigerants, hydrofluorocarbons, and then soot. They contribute about 40% of the warming. That's the bad side. The good side of it, their lifetime is very short. So if we cut down those emissions, it will thin the blanket. Okay. Now, and then, let me ask you, do you have to cut the super pollutants to zero, like the fossil fuels? Not all of them. Uh, the, the soot, we have to cut it to zero. And uh, the hydrofluorocarbons, we have to cut that to zero. We already have refrigerants, which don't warm the planet. So we have alternatives for all of them. The soot, the hydrofluorocarbons and methane emissions can be cut by 50%. Uh, let me ask you again. You said we have to get to zero fossil fuel in how many years? In 20 years. 20 years, oh, that's 2040, okay. Yeah. But right, remember, yeah, third, we, right. if, we, if we bring them from where we are, uh, 40 billion tons a year to zero, in the process, we would have added another 300, 400 uh, billion tons to that blanket. So the blanket is a billion ton, a trillion tons. And by the time you bring it to zero in 20 years, that blanket would have become thicker to 1.4 trillion tons. Right. And uh, so, what's the, yeah. so I think to, to just to wrap it all up in a simple package, we need to pull on three levers. The first lever is get rid of fossil fuels in 20 years. The second lever is cut the super pollutants. We already have all the technologies. And uh, Governor Brown, you, during your term, you passed a law uh, to cut these super pollutants. Uh, the rest of the world has to follow that, okay? I'm assuming you could have passed a law without knowing it can be done because we have technologies. California has the technologies and can export it. The third lever we have to pull 
is to suck that carbon dioxide out of the air. That blanket by 2040 would, have, would be about 1400 billion tons, which is 1.4 trillion tons. You need to bring that below 1000 billion tons. Okay. So you gotta suck out four trillion, uh, point, 400 billion. At least, if At not least. more. And uh, is that just CO2? Or do we have to get the super pollutants out as well, like methane and soot? Oh, if you cut the soot emissions, that it will be gone anyway, because their lifetime is just a few weeks <clears throat> to 10 years. So that but blanket I mean, going would... yeah. yeah, but we have to get to zero in the emissions of these super pollutants? Not all of them. HFCs, we have to get to zero. Soot, we have to get to zero from diesel. It's an easy thing, just put filters, uh, you know, uh, black carbon uh, soot filters in our diesel vehicles. The third is we have to cut the methane emissions. We have to cut it by half, not zero. Okay, that, um, Now, what about this sucking out? Do we do, is, that, is there any technology for that? And where the hell would we put it? Um, You're talking four or 500 billion tons of, of chemical, CO2 and, and uh, what are these other hydrofluorocarbons, um, and we're going to put them somewhere. I, I, I want to first give you the magnitude of that task, sucking out, but let's say 500 billion tons. The solid waste for the entire planet is 2 billion tons. So it's equal to 250 years of solid waste we generate. It's a huge amount. And there are, there are at least three known ways to do that. First is coax the soil to take more carbon. You know, to, uh, the soil, the bacteria and all the dead organic matter in the soil has a huge capacity. So we know uh, uh, already at the University of California system, Berkeley and Davis are conducting projects uh, just uh, in, in the Northern California region. Basically, uh, you know, mix certain rock dust with the soil and it will suck up the CO2. The capacity of that is about a billion tons a year, one to two billion tons a year, okay? That's worldwide. Worldwide, yeah, you have to get that, everyone to adopt that. The second, reforestation. You know, we have cleared so much and that will get you another two to three billion tons a year. So where is the rest going to come from? They have to come from chemical and mechanical means, suck the air, take the carbon dioxide out and put the air back in the atmosphere, okay? So the issue there is, what are we gonna do with the carbon we take out? And, and that has not been figured out yet. Do we just pump it deep into the ground and it could cause earthquakes? Or did we put it into the ocean and the ocean chemistry may change? So these are issues which have not been completely solved yet, but there is a potential, the mechanical chemical means can take about 10 billion tons a year, but it's going to take us 20, 30 years to get there. To be but fortunate, fortunately, this 500 billions we need to take, we don't have to take it tomorrow, we don't have to take it next year, or the next 50 years, we have to build up to that. And is there any, theoretical work that gives you confidence that such a mechanical chemical extraction can actually work? It's already happening. I think two places, one in uh, Switzerland and the other is funded by Bill Gates. It's a Harvard group who is doing a study in uh, uh, Northwestern Canada. They already have a plant, but I, I need to tell you, they've been working at it for 10 years so they can take about 100,000 pounds, we are talking about 10 orders of magnitude larger to take wow. out. So at least they have the theory. Well, uh, 
to be to be continued. Now, what about particular areas that you might call hotspots? Uh, as we go forward over the let's just say the next well 10, maybe 15 years, um, are there particular areas, California, parts of China, Russia, Europe, Africa, uh, are there hotspots or disproportionate, are there places that will disproportionately suffer from yeah. the uh, continuous heating that we're talking about? That, that's, uh, that's an excellent question, uh, Garabra. So it depends, let's, let's take about, uh, what's the most uh, scientifically exciting thing but from a human dimension point of tragic thing is that the science, climate science, just in the last five years have had a revolutionary uh, improvement. In other words, we are not able to tie in the warming to the new weather extremes we are experiencing, okay? So let me just break into three classes of extremes. The first is uh, droughts and fires. Uh, for the, the hot spots, uh, unfortunately, Governor Brown, you are sitting in one of the hot spots, Northern California, okay? Just in the last, fifth, uh, what, 10 to 15 years, the summertime, Northern California has already warmed to three degrees Fahrenheit, okay? That warming has triggered what we call vapor pressure deficit. That is the, the capacity for the air to suck the water from the soil has increased 20%. So water is evaporating from your soil and trees by, another, by additional 20%. That by itself wouldn't have been a, uh, so much of a disaster. The third, what's happening is the rainfall during fall, which is you know uh, some, uh, something between uh, September to November, has come down by forty percent. So you got three things acting together to make the fire an explosive situation in Northern California, okay? And let's, let's, not, let's just keep there. So I think since last 20 years, California is on a tailspin. It's possible there's natural variability. Maybe rainfall will come next year and rescue us. But that's, that's kind of a, we are wishing, okay? The second, even worse, what's happening is northern China. By the way, you said there were three things. I heard fires. Yeah. Fire, I, well, I, heard, I, well, you heard this uh, uh, va uh, vapor pressure deficit. Right. And that then dries up things. It makes kindling out of the vegetation and brush. And yes. therefore, we get the greater forest fires. Mm -hmm. but are there, is it, what else is there? Did, did I want to follow? Yeah. I, I, what I was going to do is I was coming up with three categories of extremes. First is fire and droughts. Fire so and I'm drought. talking about the drought. Uh, and the other hot spots for drought is Northern China. It's drying out even faster than California. And that started 30 years ago. California started 20 years ago. Northern China started 30 years ago. And Mediterranean has been drying out for the last 40 years and Amazon. So these are the hotspots for droughts and fires. Now, let me talk about heat waves. Uh, areas like Russia, Western Europe, and the Middle East are suffering some of the worst uh, uh, heat waves, heat stress. The third is storms. The entire East Coast, we know, has become a, a, a playground for hurricanes, more intense hurricanes, category four and five. 
So these, uh, and then if you look at the entire US, the Mississippi region in the US, as well as many parts, India, the months, the rains, when they fall, they're becoming intense. The intensity of rainfall has increased a factor of three in places like India and the, and the Mississippi region. So you can ask, what's the big deal about that? You know, we have more rain now. When you have intense rain, it runs off. It washes the soil nutrients. It goes into rivers, into the ocean. You need gentle rain, and that has shifted. So yeah, just to sum it all up, you ask, why is all this happening? I think what is now becoming clear is the whole global circulation has got disrupted. And adding on top of all that is the ocean circulation, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, starting with the Gulf Stream, which governs the whole climate of the East Coast and the entire Western Europe. That is slowing down. So everything is coming into what we call chaotic patterns, unpredictable. So slowly we scientists will be losing our control or even predicting this. So that's, we have an interacting set of changes, uh, some of which are baked in. So they're gonna happen no matter what we do. And it's going to touch people in different ways all over the world. So that's why you say at some point, people are all gonna get it, even though today there's still is a amount of either denial uh, or indifference. And the key thing you've said it before, but maybe you can say it uh, very clearly about this, the contributions that reducing super pollutants can do, getting rid of the soot, the methane, the floral, uh, chlorocarbon, uh, yeah. that, uh, because you hear all about CO2, uh, this is something a little different. So I think it's important that people know what it is and why it has a unique, it makes a unique contribution to the problem we're talking about. I think uh, one of the uh, tragedy in policymaking is that they're just focusing on just on carbon. That strategy would have worked 20 years ago. Now, just focusing on the carbon is not enough. I can tell you this much. If you just focus on bringing carbon emissions to zero, we're gonna cross this one and a half degrees in 10 years. And before 2050, we would cross two degrees and then two and a half. We may limit it at two and a half. By most accounts, two and a half warming, degree warming would be catastrophic. So where does the super pollutants come in? We need something which will act quick. So if we pull the super pollutant lever, we will, the planet would still cross the degree and a half warming. We would delay the two degree warming by 20 years. That's the time we need to make the carbon thing work and suck the carbon out. We need to get some time and the super pollutants will bend that curve, flatten it, flatten it around one and a half degrees till the carbon effect kicks in by mid-century. Now, uh, there are those who still hope to keep warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, beyond what it was at the beginning of the industrial age. Is that dream over or is it still possible? And if oh, you're in, is it still it, possible? It is still possible. If you pull on this, it is impossible if you just focus it on the CO2. It is possible if you do the CO2 reduction to zero and then pull on the other two levers, the super pollutants and the carbon extraction. Because you already want uh, fossil fuels at zero, what did you say in 10 years? 20 years. 20 years. Yes. Uh, well, to, to do that, 
uh, there are a lot of countries, China in particular, but others that are building these coal plants. They're gonna have a 40 year life and countries like the United States and Mexico and others are building LNG facilities and they're gonna last 20 or 30 years. So uh, I know. <laughs> The, the legacy issue is a huge issue. We are fighting this right within the UC system. Our, our most of Did you our, say the word, le, you said legacy? Legacy, uh, yeah, I think legacy. Legacy, yeah, I, the, explain that. To... Oh, uh, let me just to put it in a simpler term. Uh, the lifetime, once you build these plants, they will stay for 25, 30 years. And you don't have the capital money to replace them, okay? So, they will keep polluting. This is called legacy emissions. So we're going to have to stop from building them. But start dismantling, is what you're saying. We have to, I mean, my feeling is the countries who are still investing on fossil fuel plants are going to lose enormous amount of money because when that degree and a half warming hits in 10 years, finally, we will have massive public support for drastic actions. So at that time, they'll be forced to junk all these plants they've invested. So in one sense, uh, we're coming right to the end of our half hour here. Uh, but So the good news is that in 10 years, things are gonna be so bad that everyone is gonna agree we have to take drastic steps. The bad news is that the drastic steps will be much more expensive than if we became more aggressive starting today. Well said, Governor. I think all right. Yeah, we are all going to be looking for a vaccine by 2030 for climate change. I see. All right, well, it's good we can find uh, some level of humor here uh, in a very serious uh, matter. There are a lot of things are getting serious uh, for humanity in many, many different respects. Yes. Uh, Ron, very clear. Uh, for a, a difficult matter, but nothing is more important. And I really appreciate your uh, shedding light on this. And uh, we left out exactly what California can do about this and more specifically, but we'll have time for more. This is not the last time we're gonna deal uh, with climate change and talk about the solutions. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. It's an honor for me to be with you. Thank you.